Well, Easter is next week, and I want to challenge all of you to get somebody to the journey. Uh, That means you might have to invite like five people to get one, whatever it takes, get somebody here. And I'd like to pray for us um, that God would help us uh, get somebody here. So pray with me. Father, I do pray for our friends. I pray that they would be responsive as we invite them. I pray that you would give all of us courage, uh, that we would not be fearful, that we would believe in the message of the gospel enough to invite our friends, that we would believe in the message of the journey enough to invite our friends. And so, God, uh, we trust that on Easter, the gospel is going to be preached clearly, and that's our message. So, Lord, give us great opportunity and boldness to invite our friends so they can experience the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I'll never forget, um, years ago, I was listening to one of my spiritual heroes, and he was talking about a time when he was able to spend one hour with one of his spiritual heroes. And all kinds of things were going through his mind because he thought, well, I've got an hour, so do I ask a bunch of questions and get short answers? Uh, Do I record it, you know, with an MP3 player or whatever they had back then? Uh, Do I, what do I do? Like, how do I process this time? How do I steward this time? And so he came up with one question that he asked his mentor, and his thinking was, I'm going to ask this question and then let him talk for like an hour. It'll take like 10 seconds, and then so the rest of the time, uh, this mentor from afar would be able to, you know, elaborate. And so the question was to this mentor, how can I deepen my relationship with God? How can I really know God? How can I really experience God? That's the heart of the question. And so he asks the question, gets his pen and his paper ready, and the mentor says, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. And he was writing, and he wrote it down, and he looked up, and that's all that his mentor said. And so he's like, Thank you. And so the meeting that was supposed to be an hour was five minutes. But it, but it changed this guy's life because what he began to realize as he mined his own heart is that really our biggest temptation, honestly, is not lust, it's not coveting, it's not sexual sin. That's, that's not the biggest threat to our spiritual life. Hurry is, as Western people, Americans especially, the greatest threat, the greatest enemy to our spiritual lives. Many of us live lives full of frantic, kind of multitasking, uh, constant clutter, relational shallowness. That kind of dominates our life. We we run from one thing to another. We're kind of in this frantic, many of us, sleep-deprived state, bolstered only by caffeine, sugar, and the constant stimulus from our dumb smartphones. This is how many of us live. But this is no way to live. And so what God has done is he has, he has literally given us an opportunity to weave rest, which is the op- opposite of hurriedness, into the fabric, not just of our schedules, but our very souls. And this rest, this this peace that God has for all of us is called Sabbath. And it's the fourth in the list of God's Ten Commandments, the command to Sabbath. Look with me in the Bible in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. The text says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, notice the text says we're to keep it holy because God made it holy. The word holy has the idea of being set apart, consecrated. So he's saying, I am taking this day and setting it aside. No rat race, no performance deadlines, no rush, no frantic pace. Rest. Now, remember, we're in the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. And we've, it's funny how we treat this commandment more like a suggestion. Uh, even in some of our minds right now, we're thinking, oh, that'd be a good idea, Sabbath. I'll, I'll think about doing that. Now, what if we treated the other commandments like that? Ah, oh, it'd be a good idea not to kill somebody. I'll think about that this week. It'd be nice not to lie or commit adultery on my spouse. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of see how the week goes. 
We, we treat this one as if it's optional, but it's not. It is a command. And God is saying, I want you to keep it. Keep reading in verse 9. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Verse 8. Verse 9. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day, it is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. See, our problem when we encounter God, uh, God's commands is twofold. One, we're rebellious. Two, we're religious. So in our rebellion, what we want to do is ignore God's commands and basically be our own God. And then in religion, what we do with God's commands is we complicate them. So our temptation is to rebel against them or to complicate them. Now, our problem is probably not the religious version of the equation there, but that was the issue uh, in the first century in Jesus' day. Uh, the problem is that the, the Sabbath had been expanded beyond its scope because this is what religious people do. They, they make rules to make God stricter than he really is. They, ma they, they make rules that, that make God uh, stricter about what, what he commands and what he permits. And so religious people then and now hate uh, the gray. They, they want black and white. They don't want to live dependent upon God moment by moment. They don't want to live in the gray area of dependence upon God. They want it black and white so they can obey the rules uh, and, and then judge those who aren't keeping those rules. And this is what was happening in Jesus' day. Um, and so they turned the joy and the nourishment of the Sabbath into a burden and a drain. Let me give you an example. The Mishnah was a commentary on the Hebrew Scriptures. And the, this, it had 39 classes of work which you were not to do on the Sabbath. Now, mind you, none of these are in the Bible, but this was religious people, uh, you know, being a little stricter than God. One of those was um, you could not sew more than one stitch. You could sew one, but not two. You could not write more than one letter. Uh, you could not, if you, if you broke your arm or any bone in your body, you could not set that bone. You just, you just kind of have to deal with it, right? Uh, you could not, if let's say a building collapsed, you could clear some of the rubble in order to get the survivors, but anybody who died, you had to leave them there until the next day, right? And so what we find in the New Testament is Jesus and his disciples are breaking the harvesting rule. They're eating grain on the Sabbath. And as he often did, Jesus restored God's commands to their proper context, and he, and he did it with this phrase, man is not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is made for man. It's not a master, it's a servant. A servant. It's, a, it's not a burden, it's a blessing. It's not a rule, uh, a, a command for a rule's sake, it's a command for a relationship sake. Sabbath was made for us. And the reason why Sabbath was made for us is Sabbath prevents something you and I, some of us, are dangerously close to, and that is burnout. It prevents Burnout. You see this in the life of Jesus. Jesus not only kept the Sabbath, Jesus had the principles, as we'll talk about, of Sabbath in his daily life. And, the, and, and you see this many times in Scripture. I'll point out one. The whole town of Capernaum was at his door, and he'd been ministering to them well into the night. And so the text says in Mark chapter 1 that he rose very early in the morning while it was still dark, and he departed and went to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him and said, everyone's looking for you. So get it. Jesus is trying to pull back, trying to get some margin, trying to get alone with the Father, trying to pray, and the people keep coming. Can I get a witness? Does that ever happen to you? Right? And, and guess what? That always happens. There's always going to be people. And, 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 and it's not like they're bad people. Sometimes they're, uh, you know, Short little demons called your kids, right, that want and need and demand your attention. Sometimes it's work. Sometimes it's family. Sometimes it's friends. And it's always pressing down, wanting you uh, to focus on it, distracting you from God. Jesus knew this, so he got up early, and even that wasn't enough. But what you see constantly in his ministry, him pulling back. Why? Because he knew that that was the key to being renewed physically and spiritually and socially and emotionally. This is what Sabbath does. It was made for you because it is about helping you be renewed, 
helping you be ready to handle life's demands, keeping you from burning out, keeping you from being bitter, keeping you from looking at people as a threat instead of as an opportunity to love and serve. So Sabbath prevents burnout. Sabbath also reminds us that we're not God. Uh, Sabbath is God's way of dethroning us. Sabbath is God's way of reminding us of our creatureness. Sabbath humbles us by telling us you do not have endless energy. You are not invincible. You may not go on forever in your own strength. You may not run at 4,000 RPMs. Sabbath is God's way of showing us we're not him. It's God's way of dethroning us, but it's also God's way of dignifying us. See, when you Sabbath, what you're doing is you're ceasing from what is duty. Now, and I don't mean like your kids are saying, um, you know, your toddlers are hungry and you're like, well, get your own mac and cheese, right? Figure out the PB&J thing. I'm Sabbathing. I, I, I'm not saying you, you just ignore some of your responsibilities. What I am saying is the things that you don't have to do, you don't do. This is the day you don't do laundry. This is the day you don't shop. This is the day you don't do anything that's not absolutely urgent. And you do, that's the negative. The positive is you do engage in things that bring you life and give you joy, which means Sabbath is about play. Sabbath is about good food and drink. Sabbath is about family and friends. Sabbath is about being out in nature. It's not just avocational. I don't do certain things. It's, it's active, right? You tap in. When you, when, you are, when you are active in engaging the Sabbath, you're tapping into your dignity as a human being made in the image of God. The God of the universe gives you permission to rest, to not produce, to not be in the rat race, and to focus on being a human being, right, rather than just a human doing. And some of you are like, okay, well, what is this whole thing about God resting? And well, you know, it's a great question. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested. He rested. God rested on the seventh day. Now, I didn't understand this really until I had kids. But, but I think the best way to describe it is to show uh, two, my two youngest children. I have two older girls, but uh, this is the boy and this is the youngest girl. And so, um, Drew and Delaney. Now, these guys are actually way different than my first two children, Glory and Gracie. Glory and Gracie are really good at vegging, right? Any of you really good at vegging? Like you're tempted to take this command and like extend it a few days, right? That's, they're like that. Okay, okay, so I never had to model for them rest. I've had to model for them activity, not rest. These two, however, I mean always busy, always moving, always one thing to the next. And so I literally have to grab them, right? And I have to just sometimes hold them and just say, you know what? We're going to rest right now. We're going to relax. We're not going to do five different things. We're going to do one thing for an hour, right? Because you need to learn to rest. This is what God did. God didn't, do I need to rest in the middle of the day? No, but I'm giving them an example by kind of resting myself and pulling them into that rest. This is what God does for us. The, the Sabbath is rooted in God's rest. God rested not because he was tired, but because he was showing us a principle. See, six days God works, and, and, and works hard. <laughs> Creation uh, is pretty awesome, right? But then on the seventh day, he sat down not to rule, but to rest, uh, not to rest, but to rule. So he doesn't just, he rests on the seventh day, and then from, from, from the eighth day on, God is ruling over what he made. And see, when we take a Sabbath, what we're doing is we are confessing, we are acknowledging that God is the one who rules and reigns over his creation because he first rested. It's an acknowledgement of who God is, that he is the source, that he is the sustainer of all things. And when you and I participate in Sabbath principles, we are able to tap into that reality. 
And in so doing, when you begin to really practice this, you're going to have these Sabbath-imposed questions, and, and you don't even have to practice it to, to be imposed with these questions, like, will you trust me for a day, God asks through the Sabbath? Do you really think I will let you collapse? And, and do you think your life will collapse if you pull back? Do you really believe the whole world is on your shoulders? These are the questions that God will whisper to us when we slow down, right? Sabbath reminds us that we are not God. Sabbath also reminds us, uh, or also leads us to worship God. In verse 10, it says that the Sabbath day is, a, is literally to the Lord, right? So this isn't just about, and this is what people do with the Sabbath. Well, this is day off. It's my day off. I chill out, right? Just relax. No, no, no. This is a day of worship. Yes, it's rest, but it's also remembrance. Sabbath is about remembering God by forgetting our life for a day. It's literally about focusing on him. On Sabbath, we give our attention to God in a more focused and practically, uh, in, in, in a very practical manner. It's literally acknowledging, okay, six days this week, I was distracted by my life. But this day is different. This day is unique. This day is focused. And what Sabbath does is it quiets our heart to receive from God. I've read many books on Sabbath and quiet and rest, as has my wife. And Mark Buchanan says something very interesting. He's a great writer on these truths. He says, some knowing is never pursued. It's only received. Some things you can, you can only know if you're receiving, not pursuing. You can't just make it happen. You can't just, by the force of your will or, or the, the, the accolades of your discipline or the you know, genetic you know, impulse of your intellect, you can't make it happen. Sometimes you just have to be in a place where you're quiet and then it just comes. Sabbath is a time to receive from God. See, the goal, though, is not just taking a Sabbath day. The, the goal is to have a Sabbath heart. Not just a day of rest, but a heart of rest. Not just a day of focus, but a heart that is rightfully focused. There is a pulling back, right? It's, it's, it's kind of a, a passive thing, but then it's also an active thing. There's a pressing in. And so Sabbath is rest and engagement, engagement and rest. And what Sabbath does is it simply melts the hurry of the world off of us and enables us to be quiet, at peace, and able to receive from God. I have found in my relationship with God, and I see this in Scripture as well, if you're not quiet, if there's too much noise going on in the background or in your head, you are not going to know God that, that well. You, you're, you're going to know about God. You might have some principles. You may know some Bible verses. You may even be a leader at this church. But you're not going to know God in the depths of your being. Just like the psalmist says, to, you have to be still and know that I am God. And Sabbath helps us worship. Sabbath also reminds us of the gospel. Now, this is kind of the premise of the whole series. Look back in verse 1 and 2 of Genesis 20. I'm sorry, of Exodus 20. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now we've talked about this, but it's a good reminder. The deliverance came before the Ten Commandments. God says, I rescued you, now obey me. It's not about performance, it's about relationship. And through the Sabbath, God is reminding us of this simple principle, right? That I've saved you. Now, here is a command that will help you remember that I've saved you. Sabbath reminds us it's not our work, it's not our effort that delivered us from slavery, that delivered us from um, Egypt. It was your work and your effort that did it. I'm resting in your work, God, not my work. I'm thinking about what you have done, not what I do. And this gets us into the bigger principle of the Bible, right? The Bible's not about us and what we do for God. The Bible's about God and what he's done for us, really, and see, when we Sabbath, we're declaring it's not my work that counts. It's Jesus' work that counts. I am totally and fully loved apart from my work, apart from my performance. 
And Sabbath points us to this. It points us to the rest that we have for those of us who have ceased being our own saviors because Jesus ultimately is our Sabbath, our rest from trying to earn our way to God with our own good works, which is why in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9, it says, there is a Sabbath rest that remains for God's people. And this is where people try to say, well, that means that we don't have to worry about the Sabbath because it's all been spiritualized. No, I don't think that is true. There are certainly um, personal applications uh, to the Sabbath. But I think this text is talking about maybe some corporate implications as well. You see, Scripture tells us that Christ ultimately will return to earth and he will bring an ultimate Sabbath, right? He will come and there will be a new heavens and a new earth. And actually, heaven isn't going to be up here. The Bible says the new Jerusalem is coming down to the earth at the end of the book of Revelation. Sabbath is a rehearsal of that coming rest. So when we practice Sabbath in the middle of a broken and a jacked up world, what we're doing is we're rehearsing and reminding ourselves and the world that one day Jesus is coming. And God will come in the person of Jesus and heal all that's wounded and raise up all that has fallen and will restore all that is broken. And I would, I would challenge you with this. Maybe some of the reasons we don't bask in the glory that's ours because of the gospel, that we don't accept our own acceptance, that we're always you know, trying to relate to God with our own good works and our own good life and as Christians, maybe one of the reasons is it's because we don't live in the reality of Sabbath. We don't practice it. Sabbath reminds us of the truth of the gospel. I can rest from my work because my significance, my meaning, my identity does not come from what I do. And so I don't have to frantically go about my life from one thing to another. I don't have to, I don't have to, I, don't, I have an audience of one, right? There's nothing to prove. There's no one to impress. The ultimate person who I need to impress is already impressed, not because of my work, but because of Jesus' work. He's pleased with me, so I can relax. I can Sabbath. Now, it's not just a command, Sabbath. It is. So you need to wrestle with that. Some of you theologically are going to have to wrestle with that. And there's people who have different opinions, so wrestle with that, right? Study the Scripture yourself. But Sabbath is also a principle. So if you're hung up on the day thing, don't be. Because what we see in Jesus' life modeled is not just a Sabbath day, but a Sabbath life. And so it seems that it was his routine to get up early in the morning, you know, not because he hated sleep, but because he could be away from people. And so he got up early, uh, and then you see him throughout the day at times pulling away, right? And I think he took a lot of solace in hanging out with people who are far from God and kind of getting away from his disciples. So sometimes it's just really good to get away from church people, right? So, so, so you can do that daily. You can, you can get away from um, community, so to speak, and get out into the community. But if you're taking a day or if you've got a part of your day, what do you do? That's a great question. What the heck do I do? All right, I'm going to do nothing. What do I do? Okay, well, let me give you some things. One, this is the time to read the scripture. This is the time to pray, right? This is the time that you, you lose your excuses because you have the time. Uh, let me correct myself. You've made the time. And you can meet God in the scripture and you can meet God in prayer. You can totally do that. And, and so in that as well, you can go after the things that are distracting you. And for some of you, not all of you, one of the things that's distracting you is the TV. And so one of the things in our house that we are wrestling with as a family, and, you know, it's a long backstory, but the, but the, the biggest thing is this. We, we have a nice TV, and it's in the, kind of the central part of our house, and it's on all the time. We got little kids, so they like those little kid shows, and then it just kind of stays on. And so my wife and I are wrestling with, okay, how do we not become legalists and go, you can't watch the TV or it's only on or put it on a timer. We may, we may do that. But what does it look like for us to pull back from TV viewing? Like we're wrestling with that. I read about a, uh, 
um, Detroit newspaper that offered, they did this ad, and they offered 120 families um, $500 to not watch TV for a month. Okay? And it's funny as 93 of the 120 turned them down. You know, but for the 27 or so who said yes, they reported back it was the most life changing decision for their family ever. Right? This could go internet, you know, this could be about video games, this could be movies, whatever. Whatever media that you need to turn off, turn it off. Get away from your phone right? Some of you experience PPV all the time. It sounds like a venereal disease, but it's not. It's actually called um, foam uh, phantom vibration. You ever had this? Where your, your leg starts vibrating and you're like, oh, my phone, and it's not in there. <laughs> your body is literally like responding to something that's not there because your phone is always buzzing. What if you got away from your phone? I know you like your smartphone, but it's dumb, It's dumb because it keeps you from being with God sometimes. Another one is um, I encourage married couples, and this is just for married couples. Marriage is one man, one woman, one lifetime. And so if you're married, this is a time to enjoy your spouse intimately. Some sects of Judaism literally said on the Sabbath, um, you should have sex four times. Now, my wife thinks that's a little extreme, but this is a time, couples, for you, without the burden of the world, without the hurry of the world, to go, you know what, we're going to enjoy each other physically. Stay in bed. It's another thing. If you're, if you're taking a day or in a morning, just stay in bed. Don't get all rushed and get up. Just sit there, read. Think about what's God, what God did you know, the, the day before, what he wants to do that day. Just relax. Practice slowing Drive in the slow lane as much as it kills you. I, you know, this is very difficult for me, right? To just go, you know what? I don't have to be there. I don't have to speak. Get in the long line at the grocery store. Chew your food at least 10 times. Do things that slow you down. And then I want to encourage you with this. Celebrate. This is what God did. This is the pattern. God, act, God acts, he steps back, and then he celebrates what he's created, what he's done. So do that. Celebrate. And see, here's the thing, friends. If you don't choose the Sabbath, the Sabbath will choose you, right? Illness, burnout, um, relational brokenness, it will choose you. So choose it first. Now, to be very practical, here's what we're going to do. If you're not on the city, get on the city. Because what my wife is going to do this week, early this week, is give some very practical things. Those of you uh, that are really going, I want to do this practical Sabbath thing. What do I do? She's going to post on the city some very practical things for you to do, for those of you who are really wanting kind of the next step for this, okay? So stay tuned for my wife, Amy. She'll be getting that to you very quickly. Question is this, friends, as we close. Will you surrender to God in your weariness, or are you going to keep fighting? Are you going to realize that your work is never done? Some of you are like, okay, I'll rest when my work gets done. You will not rest. It's never done. It will always be there. And the way we are able to leave work undone is to realize God worked. right? And then God rested. And as we enter into the rest of God, which means we're trusting in Jesus as, as the one who worked for us, as the one who competed for us so that we don't have to work for God and we don't have to compete for others. And then he rested in his finished work. It's called the resurrection. It's what we're celebrating. And as we enter into that rest from death to new life, we'll rest. And that's our great opportunity. Let's pray. Father, help us to rest Help us to see our resistance to rest. Help us to see that we are living beneath our privilege. Lord, help us to taste the good life that is ours. Keep the Sabbath. Amen.